Hey everybody, um, welcome to my YouTube channel. So, tonight I want to do a um, true crime story thing. Um, I'm going to be talking about one that I have never heard of before. <clears throat> and it is the Villisca Axe Murders. It happened in Villisca, Iowa. Um, it was six people that was killed in 1912. A husband, a wife, and six kids. Four of the kids were theirs. Two of the kids were friends of theirs that they went to church with. Um, I've did. I've done some research today about it, and I'm gonna eat as we do this. I made some chicken alfredo and roasted broccoli, so I'm gonna do that as we talk about this. But um. <clears throat> I thought this was a pretty interesting story. Um, the murderer was never found. Um, they did have a man in 1938, I think it said it was, and <clears throat> he confessed <clears throat> to the murders. The only problem with that was he only confessed to six of them. When, in reality, it was eight of them, he said that um, a businessman that he didn't know had approached him and offered to pay him $5,000 to kill the reverend, his wife, and his four kids. Um, and supposedly, the guy paid him $2,000 to start with and told him he would get the rest whenever um, he seen that the that they were actually dead. Well, supposedly he split town before he could get the rest of the money because I guess he felt like it was a setup or something. But since he said that it was only six that he killed and there was actually eight that was killed, he did not get convicted of it. So to this day, a hundred and something years later, it's still an, still a um, unsolved crime. And this happened before serial killers was a thing but it also said that there was several other murders that took place um you know around the same time as this one not like same day or anything but within months and stuff that almost had the same motive they was killed with an axe and it was families and everything so it's a possibility that it could have been the work of a serial killer. Maybe the first ever serial killer. <clears throat> Nobody really knows. Um, the house was resold or bought in 1994 by a couple who, um, in a re, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyways, they returned it to its original state and made it look like it would have looked in 1912. And you can go and um, actually do tours of the house and stuff like that. It's a big, it's a popular area for um, paranormal people to go check out because they claim that the house is haunted. And in 2012, there was a guy who, I have notes here, on it so give me just a second in 2012 I got so many notes yeah in 2000 no 2014 um a man who was a paranormal person had visited the house and you know and everything and um <clears throat> He actually ended up stabbing himself in the chest, gave himself self-inflicted wounds. Um, I will post a picture that I found of him right here for you to see. And I couldn't really find too much on him because it said that um, he refuses to really talk about it out of the privacy of, I guess, his family. But um, he's okay. He survived his wounds and everything, but... It's a mystery as to what caused him to stab himself. Um, could it have been something paranormal? I mean, there's no telling. I do believe in that stuff. 
So it is a big possibility that it could have been something demonic in that house or um, a spirit, an evil spirit or something that made him stab himself. Um, I'm going to read you the story of the house and what happened. <clears throat> um, the family that was murdered was the Moore family. And then um, two sisters were murdered. Um, the Stillinger sisters. And like I said, they all went to the same church together. I will also post a picture of the family right here. The first two on the top is... Um, and all their names. Josiah and Sarah Moore, which was the husband and wife. And then the um, other three are the three kids. Um, no, the, the next three are three of their kids. And then the next row, the first one is um, their kid. And then the other two are the Stillinger sisters. Which, the Stillinger sisters was Lena Stillinger, and she was 12, and her sister Anna, and she was 8. And then their kids were Herman Moore, and he was 11, he was the oldest. Catherine was 9, Boyd was 7, and Paul was 5. And it's tragic that their kids lost their lives like that at such a young age. And back then, it was a big thing. Um, <clears throat> it was a big thing. You know, it was 1912. Like, stuff like that didn't happen. So, when it happened, the um, whole town kind of gathered around. And it said that they had over 100 people there that started traipsing through the house. So, right there, that's, you know, kind of ruin ruining the crime scene and... You don't know if anyone picked something up or if they moved anything or what happened. Um, they did have some suspects. That a few suspects and <clears throat> I found pictures of the suspects um, I will post those here as I talk about each suspect so the first suspect was William Mansfield um, he was <clears throat> from Blue Island Illinois <clears throat> he was actually the prime suspect in the murders um, he's the one that he had done some other um, killings and they were done pretty much in the same manner as the killings that um, happened or as the Moore killings so that's why he was like the main prime suspect but nothing ever came of it and then the other suspect was Reverend George Jacqueline Kelly, and I'll post his picture right here. He was another prime suspect. Um, okay, he actually had a confession, but it says it made a mockery of law enforcement practice at the time and was withdrawn before his trial began. Um, Kelly's first trial resulted in, resulted in a hung jury, and he was finally acquitted by the second. According to information presented by Kelly and Tammy Rundle, Kelly moved to Kansas City, Connecticut, and, fi and finally New York City. The remaining years of his life and his final resting place remain a mystery. So, um, you know, him being acquitted, could he have done it? There's no telling, but once he's acquitted, then, you know, they can't really do any more looking into it with him or anything. Um, and then, like I said, they thought it was the work of a serial killer, and I'll post that right here. So, apparently... William Mansfield is not the serial killer that they thought um, had done it, which he had only killed a couple of people. So, 
I don't know if that would really be considered a serial killer. To me, I guess, <coughs> I would think it would. And the other one was 25 axe murders laid at the door of Missouri con um, convict. So, um, Henry, Henry Lee Moore. And that's kind of weird that he has the same last name as the family that was killed. Um, but he was born in Boone County, Missouri, and served in the Civil War. In 1900, Henry was living with a family in Franklin County, Iowa, and working as farmhand. It is suspected that Henry may have fathered a child with the young daughter of the farmer. Henry was sentenced to the Kansas City Reformatory in Hutchinson, Kansas on a forgery charge and was released on April 11th, 1911. And these murders happened in April, no, um, June of 1912, so almost a year later. Um... His trial indicated that he had lived with his grandmother in the winter of 1911 and the summer of 1912. So the summer of 1912 is when these murders happened. So um, it says he left to take a job on the railroad. He served 36 years of a life sentence, sentence before being paroled by the governor of Missouri on December 2nd, 1949. The governor commuted his sentence on July 30th, 1956. Henry Moore was 82 years old and had begun living at the Salvation Army Center in St. Louis. It is unknown when he died or where he was living at the time. So it's a possibility that it could have been him too. <clears throat> it could have been any of them. Um, and then they had Andy Sawyer was detained by the sheriff, but he was not a suspect. Um, he was detained and questioned and everything, and there's not a picture of him. And then Joe Ricks was detained in Monmouth, 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 Illinois. He was wearing shoes covered in blood at the time. Um, he was not recognized as a man seen in Villisca asking for directions to the Moore home the day preceding the murders. So he was ruled out. And that was all of the people that they questioned and the suspects and everything. Um, okay. This is how the story goes, if you were to look it up. Um, the murders happened June 10th. And they say they happened between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, Lena, Lena and Anna Stillinger, the daughters of Joseph and Sarah Stillinger, left their home for church early Sunday morning. They planned on having dinner with their grandmother after the morning service, spending the afternoon with her and then returning to her home to spend the night after the children's day exercises concluded. And you know, back in them times, church was kind of, it was a really big thing. And so this being summertime, to me, I guess this would be like, um, you know, how we have Vacation Bible School now. So, I guess that's kind of what this would be like. Because it's called Children's Day Exercises. So, that's what I would um, think it would be. Um, the girls, however, were invited by Catherine Moore to spend the night at the Moore home instead. Prior to leaving for the exercises, Mr. Moore placed a call to the Stillinger home to ask permission for the girls to stay overnight. Blanche Lena and Ina's older sister told Mr. Moore that her parents were both outdoors. She would pass the message along to them. The Children's Day program at the Presbyterian Church was an annual event and began at approximately 8 p.m. on Sunday evening, June 9th. According to witnesses, Sarah Moore coordinated the exercises. All the Moore children, as well as the Stillinger girls, participated. Josiah Moore sat in the congregation. The program mm -hmm. ended at 9.30 p.m., and the Moore family, along with the Stillinger sisters, walked home from the church. They entered their home sometime between 9.45 and 10 p.m. 
So that's the last time that all of them were known to be alive. The following morning <clears throat> at, at approximately 5 a.m., Mary Peckham, the Moore's next door neighbor, stepped into her yard to hang laundry. I'm sorry, I could not imagine hanging laundry at 5 o'clock in the morning, but, you know, this was 1912, so they did everything way different than we did. They got up and got their mornings going early. They had a lot more chores to do. Um, at approximately 7 a.m., she realized that not only had the moors not been outside nor the chores began, but the house itself seemed usually still. <laughs> and, like today, <coughs> if something happened to my neighbor... I would never know it because we have such different schedules today. Um, you may not see anybody come or go from my house for days, and you would never know, you know, that something's wrong. Between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., Mary Peckham approached the house and knocked on the door. When she received no response, she attempted to open the door, only to find it locked from the inside. After letting out the Moore's chickens... Mary placed a call to Josiah's brother, Ross Moore, setting into place one of the most mismanaged murder investigations to ever be undertaken. Um, I want to place a picture of the house right here, too, so that you can see. And it just really, to me, it just looks like an old-timey type of farmhouse. Um, based on the testimonies of Mary Peckham, and those who saw the Moors at the Children's Day exercise, it is believed that sometime between midnight and 5 a.m., an unknown assailant entered the home of J.B. Moore and brutally murdered all occupants of the house with an axe. Upon arriving at the home of his brother, Ross Moore attempted to look in a bedroom window and then knocked on the door and shouted, attempting to raise someone inside the house. When that failed, he produced his keys and found one that opened the door. Although Miss Beck Peckham followed him onto the porch, she did not enter the parlor. Ross went no further than the room off the parlor. <clears throat> when he opened the door, the bedroom door, he saw two bodies on the bed and dark stains on the on the bedclothes. It returned immediately. He returned immediately to the porch and told Miss Pe Peckham to call the sheriff. The two bodies in the room downstairs were Lena Stillinger, age 12, and her sister Anna, age 8, house guests of the Moore children. The remainder men members of the Moore family were found in the upstairs bedrooms by City Marshal Hank Horton, who arrived shortly. Every person in the house had been brutally murdered, their skulls crushed as they slept. Josiah Moore, age 43, Sarah Montgomery Moore, age 39, Herman Moore, age 11, Catherine Moore, age 9, Boyd Moore, 7, and Paul Moore, 5, as well as the Stillinger sisters. Once the murders were discovered, the news traveled quickly in the small town. As neighbors and curious onlookers converged on the house, law enforcement officials quickly lost control of the crime scene. It is said that up to 100 people traipsed through the house gawking at the bodies before the Velasca National Guard finally arrived around noon <coughs> and um, blocked off the area and secured the home. The only known facts regarding the scene of the crime were eight people had been bludgeoned to death. Um, the time, the doctors estimated time of death around after midnight. All of the curtains were drawn and they had two windows in the house that didn't have curtains on them. So since there weren't curtains on those two windows, the person actually took the husband and wife's clothes and put them up on those windows to um, block them off. There was kerosene lamps found. Um, two of them were found. Um, the axe was found in the room. that the Stillinger sisters were in. So that tells me that possibly they went upstairs and killed mom, dad, and the four kids and then came back down and found the two sisters and um, killed them too. All the doors were locked. Um, they found a pan of bloody water, a plate of uneaten food. So that makes me wonder, did whoever did it... Um, 
make him a plate of food and maybe he was gonna sit down and eat and then decided not to or heard something and decided not to but <clears throat> this was a story that I had never heard and you know I'm pretty interested in stuff like this and it was a story I've never heard and I just thought it was pretty interesting and it's in interesting too that you can go to the house and actually go in and tour it and um i think you can even stay the night for i think it's like it said it was 430 dollars or something like that but a lot of people do believe that the house is still haunted today and it could be a possibility that um everybody who was killed is still there occupying occupying the house um they may not be able to rest until um or they may be may not be able to rest because it's unsolved no one ever found out what happened of course whoever did it is I'm, you know, not alive today, <clears throat> but I just thought that was a big thing for it to happen in 1912, and I'm sure there's other stuff that have happened like that way back when that we just don't know about, but for you to actually find information on something like that, it's definitely really interesting. Um, you can look it up if you want to online. It's the Vel the Velasca Velisca axe murders. Um, let's see. There was something else interesting about it that I had seen in here. I printed out everything that I could find on it to talk about oh yeah the um man who stabbed himself in the house it was said that he stabbed himself around 12 45 a.m which is the time that they believe the murders happened so may you know that's a big coincidence I mean, they also say that he was unstable and this, that, and the other, but <clears throat> they say that about a lot of stuff, especially if it's paranormal and you can't explain it, then they have to find a reason for something. Now, I do wonder about the prisoner who said that he did it. And the fact that he knew so much about the murders, but just had the wrong number of people. <clears throat> and yeah, maybe he, you know, read it in a newspaper or something when it had happened. And maybe he just wanted his five minutes of fame or to be remembered or to have some kind of, um, his name's going to stick around. But, if he would have read it in the papers, then he would have had the number of people correct. So, I'm thinking maybe he was approached to do it, but maybe took part of the money because he said he got paid 2000 And maybe he took part of the money, but never went on with the crime. And that's how he knew that, you know, the mom and dad and four kids were murdered, and maybe that's why he didn't know that there was two other people that were killed also. That's a very good possibility, too. I'm surprised with it being such a small town that, the, that no neighbors heard anything unless maybe nobody woke up and they was killed in their sleep. But... I could imagine if you hear 
somebody using an axe on somebody that would be pretty loud and you would wake up and scream or something. So it is weird that nobody heard anything. And it kind of makes you <clears throat> want to try and come to your own conclusion. Did a neighbor do it? Did, you know, and it said that um, after this murder happened, it kind of split the town. Because everybody started blaming everybody. So people that were friends um, were at odds with each other over who had done it, what had happened. And so it just pretty much completely ruined this small town. But I hope y'all really enjoyed that story. I wanted to kind of end my video with my big old man right here since you could hear the dogs in the background um, playing and stuff in the story. I will do another video like this again. I might do another story when I do a nail video. So as I'm doing my nails, I'll tell another one of these stories. But, if you enjoyed this video, then please consider subscribing. Um, give me a like. Comment down below. Let me know what your opinion is on it. Do you find it as interesting as I do? Is there other stories that maybe I should look up? Um, just let me know. And I hope to see everyone in the next video. And I hope everyone is enjoying their month of October. Fall is finally here. Hopefully... Everybody's starting to get a relief from the warm weather. We're not yet, but it's supposed to get cooler tomorrow night, so I'm excited for that. And I hope everybody enjoys their day, evening, morning, whatever time it may be where you're watching this. And I will see y'all in the next one. Say bye!